presentation here. My name is Oliver Gottschalk, professor at HEC Paris, um, and I'm joined by Alexandra and Eric here for a conversation dedicated to another very popular theme within uh, private equity for many investors, namely that of co-investing. Um, where I have a dual role here, uh, the organizers thankfully allowed me to both serve as a moderator and also participate a little bit myself in a debate on a topic that uh, I find particularly interesting and that I've been doing a little bit of my own empirical work on as well. Um, of course, from the from the perspective of the Usher Sea Research Program at the Usher Sea Observatory. Um, maybe uh, um, Alexander and then Eric, uh, won't you briefly introduce yourself and the role of your organizations as active investors in the co uh, theme before then going into the specific discussion? items. Alexander, please. Good Good morning to... go, go ahead, Alexander. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, good morning to all. Uh, such a pleasure to, to join this panel today. I'm working within uh, the team in charge of private equity funds uh, investments within the French case people, also named CDC. And as you may know, CDC is a public institution, a long-term investor serving friends public interest and economic development. Uh, a big part of CDC's resource comes from regulated uh, French savings of French people uh, and regulated uh, deposits, uh, uh, mainly notary deposits. Uh, our team is composed by seven investment professionals and we're managing a portfolio of 8 billion euros. Uh, it's about uh, 250 funds uh, and, and nearly 100 uh, GPs uh, listing in Europe and, and North America. Um, so, good morning everybody, my name is Eric Duran, I'm one of the managing partners of Flexstone Partners, I'm based in uh, Geneva, uh, Switzerland. We, um, Flexstone Partners is, is a private equity investor which is part of Matixis Investment Managers. We manage approximately 8 billion in private assets, we do primary, secondaries and co-investments. We have uh, 44 employees and 4 offices, Geneva, Paris, New York and Singapore. Um, Oliver, to answer your question, with regards specifically to co-investments, we've, we've been doing co-investments since 2008. Uh, we've deployed, um, you know, a little bit less than a billion in total in co-invest across 104 to this day co-investments. Uh, so, I, you know, I think we can claim to have a, you know, reasonable experience uh, to talk about the, the sub-asset class, and I look forward to the discussion. Absolutely. Th th thank you very much. Thank you very much. As I said, co-invest have been become basically the center stage in private equity over the last uh, decade or two, starting out from very early efforts by some specific investors, you know, uh, GIC comes to mind or GE Capital, who basically started to leave the role of the very purely passive limited partners outsourcing the investment decision entirely and become a little bit more involved. And the objective of this was obviously um, to be closer to the transaction, to hopefully benefit from better uh, allocation of capital to particularly appealing deals, but also, um, and this is of course still today an important consideration to save on the fees because, you know, initially always, as I understand, and then still for a good part today, there's an opportunity for the partners to deploy capital on a kind of no fee, no carry basis, thereby lowering quite substantially the overall fee drag. Now, this has been appealing per se. Lots of investors were attracted to this. There's a range of reasons, as we know, for this beyond the no fee, no carry or the allocation of capital. Some uh, limited partners like to do co-invest to kind of get the GP to know really well, because some of them will tell me, um, well, once you've done an actual deal with a GP, you really know how they tick, and then you know if you want more capital in their next fund. So it may be an entry into the fund in that relationship. On the other hand, uh, sometimes it may be the exit from that relationship because some investors went even a step further and lots of the Canadian players come to mind there who basically then graduate at some point from an active capable co-investor to a pure direct investor to circumvent therefore the GP and, and cut out that that, that part of the value chain altogether. Now, um, it's gained popularity, it becomes standard practice. We were discussing this in the preparation of the call. Roughly a third of all capital today is in one way or the other managed outside the typical two and 20 closed in fund structure, either through co invest or through other kind of managed accounts. And the question, therefore, therefore uh, comes up. Is this desirable? Is this good or bad for GPs and LPs? And Eric, I know we've been um, uh, looking closely also at the research side of this, which which uh, has been spearheaded years ago by my, by my Harvard colleague, Josh Lerner. Uh, why don't you shed a little bit of your perspective on, on, on that question of the co-invest debate? Yeah, thank you, Oliver. Absolutely. Um, Josh happened to have been one of my professors, and I, and I, read, um, I read his research really, religiously in, in, indeed. What I would 
what I would wa want to say is definitely co-investment, and you, 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 you mentioned the numbers, co-investment sh should be one of the arrows in the quivers of any LPs for a variety of reasons, which we, we will debate. Um, the other notion I would like to believe, uh, you know, to um, put on the table up front is looking at research, looking at our experience, I think it, it is very important for any investor not to do blind co-investments. Um, and when I say blind, it, I mean, you know, passive, take all the co-investment you, you have been offered and just do them. That um, that has shown that the performance uh, and and, uh, and you, you mentioned uh, Josh Leonard's research on this, which uh, the latest version was published uh, back in uh, mid 2019, and and there's further research from Prequin and other and, and other data databases, which shows that co-investment, if you do blind co-investment, on average you would underperform, not only your expectation but also more importantly the performance of the GP itself. Um, so there's clearly a selection uh, criteria. And the, the, the importance of the selection when you do co-investment is very is really clearly shown by these numbers. And and in uh, Josh Leonard uh, research, it's even worse than that because uh, just findings, having looked at twenty thousand deals, I think across twenty years or so, uh, says that even counting for lower fee and lower carry co-investment vehicle, you know, whatever they are, whether they co-investment fund or they dedicated co-investment overflow vehicle directly managed by the GPs, tend to underperform. Um, so, so the learning there is, um, you know, not all co-investments are treated equal. Uh, you know, all the, the manager, the, all, including the best manager, they do bad deals from time to time. And, and, and this research could suggest that it, it's more, more often than not on the bad deals that the GPs offer co-investment. So, so if, if, if I put it back together and, and looking at you know, our performance and obviously some of our competitors' performance, which clearly outperform the, the, the overall industry and, and, and the research uh, shown by, by Josh Lerner, I think uh, you know, the key parameters for success in co-investments is, is really to have the quality deal flow and we can discuss you know, what that means. Then you need to have a selection um, you know, skills and then you have you need to have a very efficient process. If you can't deliver, um, you know those three key parameters. I think it is very important uh, that you do co-investment via co-investment funds. Yeah, it's very interesting, and I think it links back to the more more general observation and in the in the big debate. You know, does any asset class on the average outperform? Does private equity on the average outperform? That's one question that that you know I worked on, but. Perfectly honest, I don't think this is very interesting intellectually. I think um, the much more interesting question is, are there tangible, reliable methods that get you above the average? And this is that an interesting thing to do. And of course, of course that's inherently the difference between you know, the broad scale research that, that, that Josh and other academics do to kind of figure out what the average is, and then the practical experience of teams who can put uh, skilled people to work to improve upon, upon that average. Alexandra, right, your, your organization is also, as you said, very active in the code best space. Why don't you tell us a little bit on, on your perspective there because you're not offering this as a product for other investors such as Plexstone, but you're actually doing this for the benefit of your of your own investment program. Yeah, sure. We 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 usually commit in more or less 20 funds per year, representing new commitments of roughly one one billion euros per year. And and we started our investment program uh, about two years ago, so quite recently. Uh, and, and since then, we have completed our first deals on, on resilient targets with GPs we know well. When this thing allows us to straighten our position in a focused way, you know, across a number of sectors or, or geographies as well. But above all, we are truly convinced that it allows us to go further in a partnership relationship with, with GPs. Um, and our job of selecting managers is improved because we see them at work, you know, on the ground and have access to their investment uh, memo, uh, which much more data on, on deals and much more details on, on the value creation table. Okay. And, and this allows us to discuss with them more precisely for the investment period as well. And, and in addition, investments benefit for, from more attractive financial terms, as you said, but you know, it's, it's cherry on the cake. It's not the purpose of our investment program. Uh, it's not to reduce our cost, even if you know it's, uh, uh, one of the advantage, and uh, it's we keep an opportunistic uh, and prudent, cautious approach. 
rather than being you know in a rush to invest a lot so we don't have specific targets uh, per year or, or you know in, in mind I, even if that said we want to scale up and, and but in a responsible way and 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 again first we do it with gps that we you know uh, the best and initially in europe and in sectors assets that we believe to be the most resilient at least according to us would you would you ever um, consider doing this with a GP that is new to you, more in the, in the spirit of kind of exploring how that GP ticks uh, as kind of a preloaded way of diligence for the next fund, or or do you um, always imagine for the near term to stick to what you just said in terms of you do it with the GPs you know and trust best? No, uh, I guess it's as it is a question of relationship. Uh, you know, uh, at least uh, during the, the first years. Uh, let, let's see in five years, you know. But but for the time being, uh, I think it's it's key to, to to be cautious and to do it with the GPs you 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 know best, you know, uh, because it's all about uh, relationship. Um, on the on the selection of deals, there I was just curious. What what are the key? What's the key rational that's going into picking from those um, opportunities, other than obviously the intrinsic quality of the deal? Do you use this specifically to kind of fine tune a little bit the allocation across sectors and geographies? Um, do you consciously overweight certain things, or do you basically um, solve just for the appeal of that one transaction that you have in front of you? Yes, no, it's, uh, the, uh, the, uh, there is selection, and and we do uh, uh, indeed we, we do like uh, the the most resilient uh, you know uh, uh, either assets or, or sectors. So we will not go for uh, 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 to to bet on a five x or, or plus, uh, yes. and we rather uh, like to to get you know uh, more comfort uh, on, on the uh, business plan and the probability to 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 achieve the business plan. So. We will try to keep it uh, as not a way to, to boost performances, but you know to, to be sure that it's not uh, uh, a big bet uh, on the value creation one. Yeah, I understand, of course, that, that your track record is still relatively nascent, so we'll have to probably yeah. look for the uh, Paris Private Equity Summit in 2026 in order to really uh, have conclusive insights yeah. on, the, on the outcome of this. Um, Eric, for you, it's a little different. Uh, Flexstone, uh, through its various operations, have been doing this for quite some time. And beyond yeah. this, you're not only in the in the position that you want to do this to maximize returns for, for the capital you deploy, but you're also active in the market, uh, attracting people to this yeah. code as program based on your track record. What are the key arguments you're making there? and how do you position yourself and, and present the skills that your team has in, in building a particularly attractive co-invest program for them through those co-invest funds? Yeah, so absolutely, Oliver. We, we've been doing this since 2008, as I, as I said, and we're currently raising a, um, you know, our fourth uh, co-investment fund. So it's, it's a, so the, I guess the key parameters are as follows. Obviously, there's a track record and we can, you know, talk about it, which is very important, I think. Um, you know, more than just the IR or the, or the multiple of investments, I think you should look at the risk return profile of, of the co-investment fund that we run and I guess our competitors have run. And I think, you know, it's very interesting when you build a diversified portfolio of 40 to 50 deals in a, in a $750 or billion dollar fund, um, you know, you have a, this level of diversification, which allows you to, 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 I think, bring to the investors not only a very good return, but also a very low uh, loss ratio. Um, and therefore, you have a good risk return profile. The other thing that we'd like to talk about is the fact that we are a global firm. So we have offices across, um, you know, across geographies. The main market, obviously, are U US first, Europe second, and, and Asia third. And we've been doing co-investment in the three geographies for the last, um, you know, 12 years plus. Um, so, and, and the final point is we, we remain in the small and mid market. <laughs> Um, because we believe that there's more alpha to be had there. You know, it's a, it's a more diversified, less efficient market as, you know, I'm not going to repeat the benefits of a small and mid market, but we've always been in the mid market. So define as enterprise, enterprise value between 50 and $500 uh, million. And so, so our product is a global mid market co-investment funds, which, you know, you, you don't tend to have that many uh, because to, to be efficient in co-investment, you need to have the uh, GP relationship on a local basis. You need to have this intimate relationship with the GPs because as Alexander said, it, you know, it's mostly including for us and we have a team to do that. We have 20 investment professionals who do co-investment all day long. Um, you know, you still rely mostly on the on the GP skills, right? Um, we uh, I like to use the analogy that when you do co-investment, you're a passenger 
you know, ne sitting next to somebody driving a car. Um, and as a passenger, you can be, you know, you can express your opinion. You say, yeah, I think you're taking the wrong road or you're taking too many risks or stuff like that. But at the end of the day, you're still a passenger, right? And you're not holding the wheel. So, so the, the, the relationship with the GPs remains the key. And to be small, mean market on a global basis, you need, you need to be local. Um, and that, that is, these are the three attributes that we bring with our product, you know, small mean market co-investment. Uh, with uh, good risk return uh, performance on a, on a global basis. With regard, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was about to say, with regard to performance, I think it is, uh, you know, looking at the research, uh, you know, over the years that has been done on, 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 on um, you know, co-investment specifically, but in private equity in general, on private equity in general, I think the key insight that everybody has uh, seen in uh, doing co-investment is really the fact that all GP make bad deals, right? Uh, no matter how good you are, you know, regardless, you look at you look at the um, you look at the um, the performance of the funds, and we, you know, two thirds of what we do is investing in funds, right? So we have we have more than four hundred funds in our portfolio, and you look at all of them. There's always one or two bad deals in there, and 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 the key and 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 anecdotal evidence, uh, you know, and and research from Josh and others show that you know the co-investment opportunities tend you know, to overweight those, those bad deals when you have the, the full hindsight, right? So the key for you in your selection process is to really avoid those uh, bad deals to, to be able to have a very low loss ratio and a good return. So so what we, you know, what we aim to, to do is have a loss ratio, which is below 5%, which is about a third of what the industry averages in private equity and, and return 2x net and 20% net. And we've been achieving that so far. How do we do this? It's exactly as Alexander said earlier. You know, you you focus on your knowledge of the GP, and you only invest, uh, you know, with this within the sweet spots of, of of the GP, and that is our first screening. So, because of our primary uh, investment program, we see a lot of co investment opportunities. Going for, so that's a qualified deal flow because we know those GPs quite uh, quite well, and we value them and we rate them because otherwise we wouldn't invest with the you know in their funds. So we have a qualified deal flow. When you apply the screening, uh, the sweet spot screening, and we develop a proprietary tool to do this, then you go from 100 deals down to 20 deals, and you go from a highly qualified deal flow to a very high qualified deal flow because these are the 20 deals that are really truly sweet spot, you know, for the respective GP you're going to co-invest with, and and that's how we've done it. And then you do obviously the due diligence that is expected from any co-investors, but having that first step allows you to really, I think, and, you know, our, I think hopefully our performance shows that, uh, you know, um, weed out very early on, uh, you know, the, the, the bad, the pro probably bad deal. So if you look at, you know, the way we've done this, uh, the result, I mean, we, we have very, very few 10Xs and, and stuff like that. We, you know, we don't shoot for the fences. The opportunistic deal from the GPs tend to be the, um, you know, the, the ones that shoot for the fences. There's lots of 10 axes, but there's also lots of zeros, and we don't want the zeros, so we have virtually no zeros in our portfolio. That's that's kind of the uh, the way we think about co-investment. At the end of the day, and I'll finish with it. You know, we don't have the same resource as the GP, and we don't have enough, you know, the same time to execution as the GP. So we need to find a way to be efficient, and that's the way we've done it. Mm -hmm. very, very very interesting and clearly speaking to the requirement of substantial kind of uh, skills and and, uh, and experience in, in those areas uh, uh, Alexander, as, as the organization is a little bit newer to that game can you share a little bit with us what's the thought process at CDC that went through kind of entering that space and possibly staffing up and at what point did you decide that the team is, is, is ready the deal flow is ready and you can actually launch a, a potentially uh, value adding bonus program for yourself yeah yeah sure in, in our opinion, the, the first two criteria for investing are, are the size of the fund uh, portfolios, you know, talking about primary investments in, in funds, and, and secondly, the uh, size of the team. The, the first one uh, is a precondition to have access to investment opportunities uh, on a regular basis with, with this quality and qualified uh, deal flow, you know, with, with those over allocation, uh, as, um, as Eric mentioned. And, and the second, uh, the size of the team, is fundamental as it takes time and additional skills, uh, you know, to do co-investments. And, and we believe that uh, for this to work well with GPs and, and within our team or within the LP team, 
there needs to be a lot of upfront discussion and organization of the process uh, together with the GPs talking about uh, you know, the draft of LPAs and, and timeline of well in advance and long before the first co-investment opportunities arise. And in this way, it's possible to anticipate as well uh, as possible, you know, and to be uh, the most reliable and, and quickest uh, to say yes or no uh, within a time frame that is often limited to just a few weeks and, and without being able, you know, to anticipate day one of, of that process. Uh, so it might be, you know, the uh, opportunity this afternoon, and we will be, uh, we'll have, you know, like one week or two weeks uh, to, to, to decide if we want to go further or not. And, and it's very important to, to keep a very good relationship with the uh, GPs to, to, to be able, you know, to, uh, to, to be, to show that you, you will be really able, even if it's a yes or no. Yeah. Um, at, at the risk of being a bit more provocative, let, let me turn this around and, 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 and play a little bit the GP's perspective on this. So, you know, I'm running my GP business here, I'm living off of 2 and 20 in fees. I have a lot of kind of very, um, very um, uh, dear limited partners um, and friends in my, in my investors. Um, now, basically, you're asking me for a fee discount as my limited partner. So, of course, you bring value to the table, but um, I have a tough choice here, right? I have I give away economics by giving away co-invest rights. And then if I give them away, my understanding is that they're not so clearly defined, written in stone that a given deal comes along and all of a sudden I have 30, 40 limited partners who at some point have the expectation to get a co-invest. Now, I don't necessarily want them all running around on this on this transaction. Um, I want to make sure of transaction security. This last thing I as a GP want is to lose the deal because you know somebody doesn't get their act together. How do you, from the limited partner side, navigate those kind of dynamics in the sense that you are actually value added and helpful to the investment overall um, and don't derail the process, where at the same time you make sure you do get your fair share of the co-investment rights that you that you hope from? So, Alexander, you want to address this? Or yeah. Go ahead, Eric. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so look, it's a, it's a very interesting one. And I would like to say that pretty much all our co-investment are on no fee, no carry basis, right? So so, so that's stated, and, and you're right. I mean, for the GP, what's the point, right? So there was some research done, uh, you know, in the past who, uh, who asked the GP why. Uh, well, I think one of the reasons is simply that, um, you know, the, the, main, the main LPs are asking for it, and they, they really don't have a choice. You know, I like to say, uh, you know, it's a bit controversial, but I like to say that it's a ploy, it's a marketing ploy to keep the two and twenty on the on the cover. But in fact, for the LPs uh, or the large LPs, it's not two and twenty anymore, right? It's uh, maybe one and a half and um, whatever the number is, right? So, so that that is a reason. But the point you're making also is is so important. You have to be totally transparent with the GP uh, because. You know, the risk, and again, there was some uh, research done or surveys about this, the main risk for the GP is clearly derailing the, the deal because the, you know, you need this extra 10, 20, 50, 100 million, whatever the number is. And if it doesn't show up on closing day, you kill the deal. And that is, that is, uh, that is a very bad for everybody's concern. In the US, what they've done now, they, they obviously have those dedicated uh, co-investment funds directly managed by the GPs. Those have tended to underperform, as you know, research has shown. But also in the LPS now, it's pro rata, right? You, you get 10% of the fund, you have 10% of the co-investments. In, in Europe and in Asia, it's a lot more driven by relationships still. And we, you know, because we do co-investment very well, we're very transparent with the GP and, we've been, you know, we have those relationships. We tend to over, you know, to, to have allocation which are significantly above, you know, our MP state, if you will. And, and, and reactivity is so important. Um, so these, these, these would be the, the points uh, I'd like to make. Alexander? Yeah, I know, so, so, so same opinion uh, here. Um, I think as, uh, at least for us, as it's small checks, you know, uh, we are not asking for, uh, if you commit uh, 50 million, we will not ask for, for 40 million uh, euros of investments. So as it is a small share um, portion of what we, we are committing to, to, to GPs, uh, funds, uh, it's, you know, uh, there are lots of advantages for, for the GPs as well. And, and as it is not a, a, a big part of our commitment, I guess it's not a big issue that it's with no fee and no no carry uh, terms. 
Now, you, you mentioned um, uh, at some point kind of the, the, the size dimension, especially you, Eric, by being, by being active, obviously, in the, in the, in the, in the true mid-market or lower mid-market. Um, the co-invests have a specific aspect there that, that, that was obviously featured in, in Josh's very early research that um, on, a, on the most simplistic level, the initial finding would be that, uh, you know, it's the relatively larger deals that are being proposed for co-invest and those yeah. based most research are the ones that don't necessarily outperform so much, but at least you have a, a relatively more stable set of outcomes, which will go with your lower lower loss ratio. Um, if I play this into the context of kind of the evolution of the life cycle of a GP, some cynics will say, "Well, it's a fantastic stepping stone for the GP to do for the GP to do what they ultimately want: raise more funds, generate more fees on AUM, because hey." If I'm managing three billion at the next fundraise, I'm going to be beaten up by growing to five, and I can point to two billion co-investors and say, "Hey, I've been managing this money already. Why do you worry about raising me, me raising a five billion euro fund?" Of course, the next five billion euro fund will again have thirty percent co-invest and so forth. Now, um, with this biases in mind, how do you manage that relationship overall, in particular? Uh, what there beyond reasoning in terms of the sweet spot uh, logic that, that both of you mentioned, are there additional considerations that come in that try to protect you and your investors from being left over with the lemons? Like those deals proposed yeah. for co-invest, not because of the great deals, but because it's a really good way for the GP to make that next step to a meaningful step of in fund size. Yeah, so if I, uh, just two seconds on this. The, the first thing is we we stay, even within our primary programs, we stay within the small and mid market. So so when the GPs go, you know, beyond a certain size, we just drop them. Uh, you know, we, we're not an investor. So we, we have this problem at some point, and it's a, it's a contradiction, you know, which if you, um, you know, keep your reasoning to the end of the logic, you know, co-investment should disappear in a way. Um, you know, I, I, I tend to agree with your logic. Uh, hasn't happened yet. Uh, there's a lot of them, and but so so that's one way of, of cutting that out. The other way we do this is, uh, you know, I told you we have a proprietary way of defining sweet spot size is obviously one, but we, you know, it's a tool which has eight different criteria uh, on top of uh, you know, so size and obviously leverage, the type of industry sectors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, you know, if if we can uh, convince ourselves that this, indeed the deal is a bit you know, above the typical, um, you know, size for that GP. And that's one of the reasons why they need co-investments. But the rest, you know, in terms of sector, geography, type of deal, leverage, uh, price, range, et cetera, is okay. Then, you know, we will be able to define, um, you know, that as a sweet spot transaction. And, and that's how we, we solve that problem. I mean, if you, if you think about it, most of our co-investments are tickets are between 10 and 20 million. And we tend to be one or two co-investor in each of those deals, right? It's a very much a one-to-one -one relationship. We have a few bigger deals and then broadly syndicated, but the bulk of what we do is not syndicated at all. I mean, it's just, you know, the GP not, just needs an, an extra 10 or 20 million to do the deal. And, and they call us and the two, two or three others. And depending on your reactivity, the relationship you have, et cetera, you get the deal or not. Okay. Alexandra, does it look similar from your perspective? Yes, same on our side because we we, we do love the uh, lower mid market um, as as well, and and what we've seen uh, this last two years uh, with our investment programs is that uh, indeed uh, many of the deals uh, it's only one, two, uh, and not more uh, co investors. So it's not you know, um, and, and as it is a question of uh, uh, being closer to the uh, GPs having a true partnership. Uh, a better partnership. If we think that it's only about having uh, increased AUM at the end of the day, uh, it will not be, you know, the uh, the, the right, uh, you know, uh, goal for us, and we will not uh, uh, do the in co-investment uh, as we are not chasing for investments. That, that's, you know, that's not the point. And and when we've done it, it was only a few few. Uh, uh, um, million of euros uh, extra uh, for, for, for the GP. So it's not, I think the, the fund uh, should have done the, 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 the deal uh, alone if they want to. So, you know, it's more a question of being a partner, mm -hmm. even if, you know, uh, you are a passenger, as uh, Eric said. Uh, yeah, in, in this part of logic, the, the last point I want to discuss with you before we, before we get into Q&A with the audience uh, is obviously that the co-invest 
brings the limited partner closer to the action with with probably additional points to to to, to weigh in and influence but also um uh, additional kind of responsibilities in terms of justifying something to to your investors now um esg is of course a, a very core consideration for many investors these days what's the particular angle that you're bringing in in terms of esg when looking at your co invest um shall i shall i start yeah so we we've decided that uh you know according to the new uh, european taxonomy uh the sfdr uh, regulation right our co-investment fund will be a chapter eight fund so which means an esg fund not an impact fund right but with esg consideration we have developed over, over the years uh you know a very detailed uh esg screening and scoring system uh for all the transactions when you're fund of fund it's extremely hard to apply this i mean the best you can do is put a side letter, you know, and say to the GP, please don't invest in those sectors and please consider ESG as something that is important. When you're a co-investor, again, it's a partnership, right? So, so you're much closer to the, uh, to the action and you can actually direct, uh, you know, into parentheses, I guess, because you're still the passenger, but you can actually direct a lot closer what's going on in terms of ESG. Not only looking, you know, looking at uh, the sectors, but um, and and the uh, the ESG value creation over time, but also having access to the data so you can do the proper reporting to your clients. So I think co-investments uh, funds or co-investment directly is is actually quite interesting to um, you know to um, improve and uh, increase the acceptance of ESG over time by GPs. And and I say. You know, if you look at geographies, again, we, we invest on a global basis, right? There's a, there's a very different level of acceptance in terms of ESG between US, Europe, and, 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 and Asia. If you just take the, um, the UNPR signatories, right, I think more than 50% of the GPs we have in our portfolio in Europe are, have signed the UNPRIs. Uh, I think if I look at uh, our portfolios in, uh, in the US, it's, it's less than 20%, and in Asia, it's less than 10%. So, so as, as, as a co-investor, I think you can do a lot more advocacy. And we believe very strongly that the ESG is there to stay for the right reasons. And, and, it, and we have a role to play and it's very important to emphasize this. Excellent, thank, th thank you very much. Alexander, from your view? Yeah, as a public institution, it has always been, uh, you know, a key uh, topic uh, to, to, to us. And we want to promote uh, the best ESG practices. And, and it's more and more part of the investment process. Uh, it's evolving in the right way, and many GPs are developing their uh, ESG policies, especially in North America. Uh, as Eric said, you are being more advanced in that field. And now, um, doing it, uh, you know, uh, trying to promote ESG, uh, doing co-investments, it's, it's a great, uh, it's a great tool, and I think it's an efficient tool because. If you want to, to, to go a step beyond and, 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 and trying to, uh, for the GP to get uh, robust ESG policies, you, you need to do it by monitoring, reporting, benchmarking, having KPIs, actions, you know, uh, and, and thanks and staff ESG team, but also within the deep team. And so when we are discussing at the beginning of the process with the deep team, uh, it's a great way to see how they, they will be monitoring, you know, ESG KPIs. Uh, together with the deep team and and how they are to, uh, working together with the uh, ESG uh, team uh, within the, the GP. So I think it's a great way to to promote ESG, and I think that it's, it's it might be one of the major changes in the coming years. And so best GPs have to be proactive, not, not only you know good good, good uh, uh, having only good practices. Very, very, very interesting. Thank you. Now, I don't want to um, abuse my privilege to uh, be, be asking you questions, have the conversation with you. I know there uh, should be the opportunity for, for uh, the audience to also interact directly with us. So at this point, I'll, I'm handing it over to the organizers to see if we can have a bit of a Q&A here um, and address directly a uh, topic of interest from the, from the audience. And Oliver, if you have time, I have one question for you as well, if you... <laughs> please, please shoot. I will, will qualify you as audience for a second before Margot jumps in. Go ahead. Yeah, no, so when we were preparing this uh, panel, you, you were referring to a study you, you, you're doing uh, with a large co-investor, right, and looking at adverse selection bias. And I'd be yep. interested to uh, to hear your views, your preliminary views on, on this famous adverse selection uh, issue, because there's always, you know, there's a lot, a lot of debate around it. 
Yes, so I think it's it's a question of how to define ad adverse selection. Again, that, that research is, is not conclusive yet. I'm currently working on a, an advisory capacity with one of the very, very large uh, asset managers who have both an, uh, probably one of the largest uh, portfolios and primary investments, but also a very, very long-standing co-invest program. And the way we try to get to the bottom of it is to start a step earlier than what others are doing by not asking the question, what are the deals you got in your portfolio? But what were the deals done by GPs that you screened? Because the very first selection bias is, of course, that the limited partner makes a choice who to let into the primary portfolio. And from there, we go, as usual, to say which of those deals by GPs that you've chosen proposed co-investments to you. The next step being which of those co-investments did you, the co-invest team, pick and choose. And then finally, which of those did you actually get? And um, we're not done yet. I'm, maybe next year, if the client allows me to share the results, we can do this as one case study example to see what those different steps are. But, but I want to be very clear, this is different from Josh's work, uh, who's trying to aim for the understanding of the average overall, because here we have those explicit biases at play to show that the degree to which an, an active investor can actually approve upon those. From the, from the initial work that we've seen, we see obviously some of the trends that the, the size aspects matter. So the relatively larger deals being proposed to co-invest, the relatively larger funds um, proposing more for co-investments um, are not necessarily having the right um, risk return uh, uh, characteristics to begin with. But at the yeah. same time, obviously there's, there's a skill set in play that can mitigate the uh, the risk return outcomes. And what I've seen in my work, um, I like to not only look at the performance aspect, but also basically how the portfolios of co-investment look strategically. And I see there that for the limited partners perspective, the co-investment fund portfolios can be extraordinarily appealing because they, from the get-go, have a very healthy level of diversification across deal types, across geographies, across GPs, mitigating different dimensions of risk without the usual kind of two-layered um, fee structure that you have in other co-mingled vehicles. So I think it's indeed a possibly interesting bet for somebody who wants private equity exposure you know, to the mainstream, to the core of private equity, um, with a limited amount of capital and without the ability to place lots of individual bets um, uh, with, with a large primary fund portfolio.